Hey everyone, I'm Felicia Day, and these are the movies that changed my life. Hey everyone, I'm Ian DeBorha, and welcome to IMDb's Movies That Changed My Life, a podcast where your favorite stars break down the films that made them who they are today. This week's guest is actor, writer, and creator Felicia Day. You may know Felicia from her roles on cult classic TV shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Supernatural, or early YouTube viral series like The Guild and Dr. Horrible's Sing Along Blog. Once again, if you're enjoying the show, please be sure to give us a star rating and leave a review because every single one counts and it is very much appreciated. Quick thanks to Elaine Palladino, Mayor Pauline, Elvis King One, and John Macedo for our most recent reviews. Thanks again for listening. Here's Movies That Changed My Life with Felicia Day. I've seen you've been doing a lot of stuff uh, on, on Twitch. Obviously, we're going to talk about your movie picks in a little bit, but you've brought the guild back together uh, yes. for a four-part D&D series uh, DM'd by Amy Vorpal uh, and then the rest of the guild crew. So can you talk about that? How's that been going so far? I wanted to do something a little different, and we I wanted to do a fundraiser, and I know everyone's asking you know, for fundraising money right now, but I was like, okay, let's just do a one-off event where we, I bring the guild back together and play, we play D&D, because it's always been a dream of mine anyway, and this was a great excuse. And we ended up raising $40,000 for No Kid Hungry, which is a charity that helps feed kids um, who might be in food insecure due to schools closing, so they don't get their you know, daily lunch, which might be their only meal of the day for some children in this country, which is crazy to think about. And it was so popular. We raised $40,000. And then um, we had some sponsors come out and say, hey, let's help you make some more of these. So we're doing a four episode arc. um, And, you know, we don't know if we'll do more, but we're certainly having a great time and we have a wonderful DM. So Sunday nights at 7 uh, Pacific, come on by. We're we're not professional D&T players, but we're having a lot of fun. And, um, yeah, the cliffhanger to last week's episode, it's all on YouTube as well. YouTube.com slash watch the guild. You can watch the old episodes too. So to catch up. For those who don't know, the guild was your YouTube show that get this people came out in 2007. Oh, don't date me. (laughs) Years and years above, like before what YouTube would eventually become. I mean, I used to watch the guild on YouTube, uh, and then another YouTube series you're part of, let's talk about in a little bit. Um, what's it like for you to see like how far YouTube has come from? You were like very on the front end of like, we could do these cool series that are super geared towards niche fan bases that like is content that is, you know, is probably not going to be on major television stations and something like that. But now that's what people go to YouTube for. I mean, you're, you're at the front of that. It's I mean, awesome. yeah, I was one of the first people to do serialized um, scripted content, you know? And I think if you look at YouTube, people don't really do that exactly anymore. It's more vlogger personality Mm. lifestyle kids stuff like that's awesome I always just wanted to write stuff so the guild was kind of an outlier in that although there were a lot of sketch comedy groups back in the time Mm -hmm. doing a lot of really cool creative stuff which that's the stuff I kind of miss you know even even the serialized stuff is so hard to pull off and I think you really have to have a dedicated sort of niche fan base like you were talking about to come back every week to for um content it's the same as you know any streaming uh, platform at all. You just really have to engage in a specific um, fan base. And unfortunately, bigger Hollywood um, machines don't really value niche content. They want to appeal to as many people as possible, but the, the internet really celebrates that. So if you have 50,000 mm-hmm. people who love ancient Greek history, uh, if 10% of them support the person who does it on Patreon, well, that person can make a living, And which I think is, I just love it. I, th- I think we live in a wonderful time now where niche producers and people who have specific interests can find an audience and be popular and sustain themselves. And I think that's wonderful. Unfortunately, not so much for the scripted web series on YouTube, but it was a wonderful ride. I loved being on the cutting edge of things. I loved getting up every day and thinking like, what have I never seen before? Let's just do it. And so that kind of freedom um, is something that really appeals to me and keeps me from probably breaking through in Hollywood in a way that's big. But I, I work there enough to keep keep the little things I love going. And that's all I care Mm -hmm. about, honestly. Yeah, I mean, couldn't agree more with all that. I love that. And like I said earlier, another very early YouTube series you were part of was the Dr. Horrible sing-along blog. Yes. Uh, That completely blew my mind when I saw that. I I was in college and, because I was like a musical theater kid and I also loved- yeah, wow. yeah, I was a big musical theater kid. I loved, uh, you know, Firefly and all sorts of stuff. So all these things kind of meshed into one. I remember uh, 
one of my roommates, he was like, hey, you got to see this. And he put on like the Laundry Day, you know, uh, the first song that Neil Patrick so Harris. Good. Uh, it's one of those things that really is under, like at the time, it was a phenomenon. It really was. It was just, huge. and even now, like when I go to a convention, I will see dozens of Dr. Horribles there. <laughs> It was one of those things that you wish they could have done more with, but then they all got drafted into the Marvel world and just flourished, you know? Like, darn you for doing Avengers. You should have done a Dr. Right. Horrible sequel in your backyard. I know. Now they need to do, like, the full-length Dr. Horrible. Like, it's all there. People want it. One day, I swear it will. It's one of those things where the, the songs are so universal and loved. Uh, I know that it would be ripe for a reboot. So I, I would be there as a ghost in the background any day. And and you just did uh, the 10-year anniversary of Comic-Con two years ago, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the 10-year anniversary. There, yeah. yeah, Joss yeah. and Nathan were there. Neil couldn't make it. Um, so, But we had such a good time. And it was, yeah. it, you know, when you make something, I think that's what I love about filmmaking. It's not necessarily one hat that I love wearing. I'm, I love, I, I do enjoy acting. I do enjoy writing. I enjoy producing. But I enjoy, I love making things. So it doesn't mm-hmm. matter what it is if I make something. And when you make something grassroots like that, where there's not a lot of budget, everyone's like really there because they love it. You make friends for life. So there's not one time where I feel like I won't show up and see Nathan and just give him a hug and be like, oh, we're picking up exactly where we left off. It's like, right. you know, going to college with someone. You just kind of fall into those old patterns of behavior, you know? Well, I know I'd love to see uh, another form of Dr. Horrible in the future, but right now let's get into the movies that changed Felicia Day's life. Uh, We'll kick it off with 1938's Bringing Up Baby. It has a 7.9 out of 10 with 53,000 ratings on IMDb. Um, The film was directed by Howard Hawks, written by Dudley Nichols and Hagar Wilde, starring Katherine Hepburn and Cary Grant. The film tells the story of a paleontologist played by Grant who finds himself in a number of funny predicaments accompanied by the quirky heiress played by Hepburn uh, and her pet leopard baby. So when were you first introduced to Bringing Up Baby? I love this movie so much. I had a VHS tape, okay? This is before DVDs. And I was probably like seven or six. I was like so young. And I had, I wore out the tape. We had to go and get more tapes because I would watch this movie over and over again so much. And I think that this movie and the sensibility of the screwball, you know, the screwball humor kind of vibe, um, that really influenced how I see heroines, how I see humor, and how what makes me laugh in a, in a very formidable way. And I, it probably is kind of been a, a bane to my existence in that. When I read when I read women parts, especially in comedies, I'm so disdainful of them because honestly, <laughs> when a woman is in a bro comedy, it makes me want to die. And I see, you know, all these in the 1930s, they were giving women these incredible roles. They had flaws. They were funny. They were goofy, and yet they were still elegant and beautiful. And the guys still loved them. And that just rarely, rarely happens nowadays. Even so, maybe a little bit in the 80s, it happened. It was it had a little resurgence, but. For sure, Bringing Up Baby um, influenced me in so, so many ways and made me want to be Catherine Hepburn in that movie very badly. Uh, so I had never seen Bringing Up Baby. It is a mark on my movie nerddom, like sort of old Hollywood stuff in general. I'm not like the best at, um, but I've seen Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant and other stuff, but this one uh, I never got around to and I loved it. Oh, yay! Um, th- there's so many like really great things about that movie. A, I think if you just like looked at the script, you wouldn't again know it was from 1938. Like no. the, the the script is really timeless, and they do a lot of comedic things that still are like very seen today. Um, a lot of the payoffs, uh, you know, a lot of the setups and payoffs that happen, I think I can see in comedies now. So mm-hmm. it was pretty interesting to see like all those sorts of things. Like um, one note I had, like a running gag where uh, Cary Grant's character. Uh, of David, he always is running away from his boss, Mr. Peabody, and maybe five <laughs> or six times throughout the movie, he goes, uh, "I'll be you with you in a minute, Mr. Peabody." As like he scurries off to yeah, yeah, go yeah. fix whatever problem had happened. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's so cool. Do you notice other things that you think uh, you know current comedies, uh, TV shows, movies sort of pull from the old, whether it's this movie or, or older comedies in general? I mean, I think there's a lot of physical comedy. I think because they they tended to shoot a little bit wider, though their shots are, they didn't have the close-ups necessarily. Like when they had a close-up, it was like a really special event. You know, they tended Mm -hmm. to shoot more like a stage play. And Catherine Hepburn is so long and lithe and elegant. She really is almost like from an Art Deco painting. And like, (laughs) 
that I can I will my favorite scene in all of movie dumb is probably when he uh Cary Grant steps on the back of her dress and she has this gold lame dress that she has on and she he steps on the back of her dress and her un, like her underwear is exposed so her butt is just out and he has to st- walk behind her like to cover her back <laughs> and I I can't even tell you how many times I even just rewound and laughed so hard at that and I even to this day I will laugh just thinking about it and I think that's the most beautiful dress ever so. And, and they she has had, those like ringlets coming down yes. from like her headpiece or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And she's kind of a, she's a kooky, weird, like Phoebe from Friends kind of character. <laughs> and you would never have that character be a love interest except in sort of a weird manic pixie dream girl kind of way in the 90s perhaps. Mm-hmm. But then she would be fetishized by the guy and she's in service to the guy's vision. And yet she is just that madcap heiress. Also, there's another movie called Mad, The Mad Miss Manson, which I've always wanted to remake. And it's about a bunch of debutantes, witch girls from New York, and they stumble upon a murder, and they just can't stop t- wanting to solve the murder. And Henry <laughs> Ford is uh, the the police detective who's just like so annoyed by these debutantes, but in the end, they fall in love. So those are like the core of what I love. That His Girl Friday, any like mm-hmm. Preston Sturges movie, like for me, that's the I I watched way more old movies. I have like a, a blind spot with the sixties and seventies. Um, Mm -hmm. and a little bit of the eighties, but I watched everything from the thirties and forties. So I have this, I think that really firmly, I was homeschooled and I didn't know that wasn't cool. So like, that's where my (laughs) comedy was. (laughs) Yeah. I know it is very cool though. I mean, I think, um, you know, for me, it's like, I, I feel bad when I don't see all these like older classics that I know, like I need to see and they're super iconic. So I'm glad, uh, that when I have to get through this and talk to a super fan like you about it, it, uh, it makes me appreciate it even more. Um, well, it just has sort of an innocent fun to it. You know, like, I think it's not cool, you know, not to be edgy and like, you know, doing smoking pot and like that sort of stoner comedy of Seth Rogen, you know, this whole Judd Apatow, Seth Rogen era. Like I'm of course laugh at that stuff, but to me mm-hmm. it doesn't celebrate. Also it just doesn't celebrate women in a way mm-hmm. that the, the comedies of that era really did. Like the women were always in charge, even though they, if they were crazy, even though they were wacky, they were in command of the story. They were command of everybody around them and they drove uh, things with their eccentricities. And I think it's, I love it so much. I would love to bring back that sort of vibe in something yeah. nowadays. Yeah, Catherine Hepburn, like every scene she's in, you just can't take your eyes off what she's doing because she is so, so funny. Like yeah. in every scene, like um, I think- And she was box the- office poison. Like at the time, evidently this movie bombed and nobody would hire her. She was poison. She was well known to be- Box Office Poison until I think Philadelphia Story almost, which is mm-hmm. another one of the best movies ever made. Yes, that I've seen that. That is a great yeah. movie. I just the, the having the leopard, this weird leopard coming in yes. and out of the movie. You know, there's this leopard coming in and they they lost this dinosaur bone. And it's very intellectual in a way because like everybody sort of is from that Tony sort of Eastern seaboard kind of uh weird you know they talked with this weird Atlantic accent, which I don't even know <laughs> if people talk like that back then, but they did on screen. <laughs> I'm not even sure. You spoke about uh, Baby, who was the leopard, who, uh, for those who haven't seen it, um, a big part of it is uh, Catherine Hepburn's character of Susan comes into possession of uh, a baby leopard, and they kind of have to shepherd it around the town. That's very high level. Um, There's some funny things about that. So I looked up the lady who was... uh, in charge of the leopard in bringing up baby because when you're watching it, there's no CGI at this time. Like there is legitimately uh, a, a leopard, real leopard right next a real to leopard, the actors. For right sure. next to the actors. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. So the woman was named uh, Olga Celeste and she was an early Hollywood animal trainer. And the leopard in the movie is named her. It's real name was Nisa. Um, and apparently, <sighs> Yeah, it's just, I mean, apparently uh, the leopard and Catherine Hepburn got along like immediately. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess they connected like right away and Catherine Hepburn was super comfortable with her the whole time. But then on the other hand, um, uh, uh, Cary Grant was horrified. Oh my like, God. Hor- yes, he was terrified and like did not, and did as little scenes as possible. So I guess uh, the next time you watch the movie, like basically the leopard, if there's a leopard with Cary Grant there, he's always sort of like leaning back or slightly like, <laughs> oh he's definitely God. like not as ten- not works. as comfortable. That's what but makes it works. the movie it's work perfect. because his character is uh, incredibly uncomfortable. He's like this nebbish, nerdy paleontologist. And it's hilarious because he's always off put and he's always being one-upped by uh, Catherine Hepburn and this leper. 
So yep. it's just really funny because he's a very disempowered lead in a, in, a way, in a sense, but that disempoweredness is so endearing and charming. Yes, it's so good. Uh, and then it has my favorite quote from the movie. Um, they're looking for their dog named George, and Catherine Hepburn goes, D- uh, did you ever think of what would happen if Baby met George? Well, they'd probably get along. And if they didn't, well, the baby would probably eat George. And that's like so, <laughs> it's so funny to me because it's so like obvious, like, yeah, a leopard's going to eat a dog. But the way like her delivery of it, like playing against Cary Grant is is is, is perfect. She's so bl- blasé about it. You know what I'm saying? She's just above mm-hmm. it all. She's like, I'm floating on a cloud and everybody else can kind of uh, accompany me, if you will. But you have to put up with everything I do. Uh, Catherine Hepburn's character of Susan is often credited as like the original manic pixie dream girl archetype um you know that name has kind of been disowned and sort of kind of retroactively removed from sort of like the pop culture commentary and movie commentary lately but people say like natalie portman's character in garden state is very similar kate hudson uh in almost famous uh sarah jessica parker in la story um are all sort of in that realm how do you feel about that term manic pixie dream girl i mean i don't mind it i think it actually making fun of it marginalizes women who are different i think that mm-hmm. the utilization over utilization of women who are different to make a man realize and embrace his true spirit inside became a real bad cliche and again you have a woman being of service to a man's journey in a way where she doesn't have agency of her own like you know i mean i i wish i could have a couple uh, of examples come to mind right now but mm-hmm. You know, Winona Ryder definitely was sort of a Manic Pixie dream girl in a lot of her movies early on, but she had full arcs, you know? You would never call, like, her and Heathers or, like, uh, <laughs> Beetlejuice or whatever Manic Pixie dream girls. You know, that right. label is kind of like a Mary Sue, right? Which is another mm-hmm. kind of misogynistic term re- referring to a woman who doesn't have an arc, but nobody cares that The Rock doesn't have an arc in one of his movies, <laughs> right? So, you know, again, you're marginalizing women and telling them what they should or shouldn't be. And that uh, that same criticism doesn't apply to as many male heroes, right? To me, the worst part is, like, especially in, like, m- superhero movies where women's function is literally, they have no other personality other than to prod a man to just go farther in his character arc. It enrages me and it makes me not enjoy those movies. These women, like, I just want them to call them out. Like, can you just ask me what my day was like? Because honestly, I have a life outside you. <laughs> Even though the world is blowing up, like, I do have a personality. Um, so I get, I get a little defend, not defensive, but I just, I disdain those terms because they seem to be only directed at women. Right. Are you, well, I guess, slight spin off on that. Are you looking forward to black widow then? Yes. Oh my God. Okay. The, the trailers look incredible. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not saying every woman in every superhero is not sure, sure, sure. cool, but I, I just so tired of seeing it just, it gets very repetitive when you're like, let's see this new superheroes movie. And the female character has the same kind of function i mean pepper Potts kind of got there over many and many episodes to a more interesting place but initially of course the blueprint is always exactly what it is and i just you know maybe i'm just like okay we did it can we do something new now for me one more thing here on bringing up baby if you can name bringing up baby and two other like you know 1930s 1940s movies that you think people should watch or what are there two others i mean his girl friday for sure Mm-hmm. And then, um, what was the Claudette Colbert one where she, and is it, was it Jimmy? It happened one night. It happened one night. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. That movie is incredible. Yeah. With a uh, Clark Gable. Yeah. And then also yes. the thin man, if nobody's seen the thin man series, like just the Im- initial one, Myrna Loy and David Niven. Oh, like that is one of my favorite movie series of all time. And the fact they haven't remade it, there was just an elegance and sort of like a European sophistication to people in that era that I'm like, can we just all be like that again? And we can all wear ascots <laughs> and go to cocktails. And I don't know. I just, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it basically formed my idea of adulthood. And I've been disappointed since. <laughs> <laughs> that is an interesting uh, segue that I'm going to take you on now then. So your second movie is a 1990s slacker, which is written and directed by Richard Linklater. Yes. Uh, it is a 7.1 out of 10 on IMDb with 18.9 thousand ratings. Um, so this one uh, it is a slice of life movie uh, that takes place in Austin, Texas. That has a whole bunch of characters. No main characters. A whole bunch of characters shifting around the movie. Um, that has a very different uh, portrayal of what adulthood is like. So set yes. the scene for Slacker for me. Well, I mean, here's the thing about Slacker. It's kind of like I had to pick a a, a movie that changed my life, and like mm-hmm. Slacker contributed to a huge change in my life. In that, 
I was in Austin. I went to college in 95 uh, because I went when I was 15. And so I, I had a full scholarship to college in Austin and I went as a violinist. And so a couple of years into college, I started becoming involved in the film festivals just from a volunteer point of view. And like me being exposed to, because Austin film exploded around then. Um, it was Richard Linkerlater and uh, Robert Rodriguez. And they basically were like, we're going to bring Hollywood back to Austin. And the zeitgeist of them bringing Hollywood back to Austin was so uh, culturally significant in the city where Austin became kind of like a second Hollywood while I was there from like 95 to 2000 when that's when I moved to LA. So to me, like Slacker really, it kicked off a sort of indie film zeitgeist. Also, it blew my mind in that it's so narratively different. Like it has, mm -hmm. it kind of hands off the lead from location to location. And it, it was something I'd never seen before in that it broke all the rules and yet worked. And so yep. that contributed to the creation of Clerks, which also totally influenced me because that movie puts a camera in your hand imaginatively, you know? It mm -hmm. inspires you that you can pick up something and you can make something without the permission, without being polished. It is empowering in a way that movies had never been before. So El Mariachi, Slackers, Clerks, those are kind of like the zeitgeist that got me into film in the first place and certainly changed my life for the better because I wouldn't be here without that cultural influence. After you saw that, did you sort of go back and sort of try and catch up on movies you think you may have missed as a result of being introduced to this completely new style uh, of filmmaking? It actually got me into Cassavetti's films, which also are greatly underappreciated. And I wish mm -hmm. I could rattle off some that off the top of my head. But at the time, I haven't watched them in so, so long. But at the time, mm -hmm. it really got me into that sort of – like they had such an improvisational quality to them because a lot of times they were improvised. They had sort of a small, intimate, very character-based um, – it's not – and also Woody Allen films. Like if you watch mm -hmm. like one of Woody Allen's first films, like, you know, he's talking to the camera. He's doing mm -hmm. all these things where you feel like – like whatever you feel about Woody Allen as a person, um, groundbreaking sort of cinematic style in that they're they're – they're just breaking rules all the time, but they're engaging in a way that makes you feel like you could reach out and be in the movie yourself. And that sort mm -hmm. of breaking of the fourth wall, I think, defines modern filmmaking. And it was kind of pioneered by a lot of people, you know, over the years. But certainly those kind of auteurs define that pattern. I don't know. I'm sure you could, you as a bigger film person could name more <laughs> um, of, than that. But that comes to mind to me. Um, yeah. To me, rule breaking is very, very important. And it's the only thing that really gets me up in the morning. So uh, that's why I don't really sell a lot of pitches because I just can't figure out how to please those executives. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I just want to work on small projects I love, uh, regardless of where, how they get made. Um, so when, were, when was the first time you saw Slacker? So was it at that film festival you were volunteering I think it in? was at like a special screening of either the Austin Film Festival or South by Southwest. And like I... I um I literally was taking tickets at South by Southwest like for years and I got, went back and actually did a keynote speech there for the tech and I actually was so bowled over by that experience because I remember just being <laughs> an, uh, I remember being so proud of my lanyards as a volunteer and then just coming back and doing a keynote was such a thrill. Yeah, so I think it was because of I it was definitely because I was in the I, I was at the Austin Film Festival and South by Southwest volunteering that I encountered the movie. And it was at a screening at one of the indie houses in Austin. I, I was just like, whoa, you can do this? And I know that that spirit, I would never have picked up a camera and started making my show The Guild without having that as a touchstone. You know, creatively, that's why you have to, as an artist, expose yourself to as many different things in whatever category it is, whether it's architecture, uh, literature, writing, um, you know, gaming, movies, TV. Like, unless you're exposed to it as an artist, you won't think about it. You won't even have it in the back of your mind that is it, something exists and is possible. And that's what we need. You know, that's really what representation means. Like just being exposed to something and being able to see a path for yourself that you never would have seen before because you were exposed to it. So I know that that sort of zeitgeist of not only just Rick Linklater and Robert Rodriguez, like setting the benchmark of, yeah, we can do this. We don't need Hollywood. That rebellious mm -hmm. nature it's deep in my soul and I wish I could slap. I, I wish sometimes I could, I could fight it, but no, it'll always be in my soul. <laughs> uh, it's funny. Cause I wrote that in my notes when I uh, watched this again, I said, 
my note was, uh, Felicia made the guild popular by going against popular ideas of how content should be created and distributed. And it's funny, that's like my thought exactly on Slacker, that that was sort of mm-hmm. out of, you know, out of nowhere, uh, changing sort of the format of how movies should be made. Uh, you know, that movie had like almost like zero budget. Yeah, uh, how no it was budget. distributed, and then you, you did the same thing for the guild. Was that in the back of your mind when you were making the guild? I think once I got into it, I mean, I was so scared. I think I've been in Hollywood for many years, and I think that Hollywood, if you don't have a box to fit in to be able to present yourself in, you are rejected wholeheartedly. And I will always have that experience, no matter how successful I've been. I have never been like, embraced or approached by the system to be a part of more things. And that is just, Mm -hmm. I've actually come to the conclusion, like, that's okay. You don't have Mm -hmm. to be part of every click to be successful, to make your, uh, you know, your art, to be happy with yourself. And so at the time I was so beaten down about not being accepted anymore, anywhere, that the fact that when we released that little episode and shot it in our houses, first of all, the process of making it was amazing. I went to Goodwill's and I got exactly the right set dressing that I love, you know, I would, I would paint the wall myself, you know, it was being involved in every aspect of the filmmaking was so empowering because I was used to just being a puppet on screen, right? Not doing the right things in a sense. Cause I did a lot of commercials, which is even worse for artistic integrity. It's like your, your cup isn't high enough. You're so stupid. Right. So, and I think once I saw that audience responded to what we made in our garage for literally $200, I was like, this is what I want to do with my life. And that rules breaking, definitely I realized, oh my God, this is what I should have been doing the whole time, just going around the system. You know, as you say, you may not be in like certain Hollywood circles. You can't walk around San Diego Comic-Con anywhere without getting, having people come up to you and thank you for the content you create. So, you know, if you're at a panel on Hall H, you get that standing ovation from these thousands and thousands of people all cheering for you um, for the content that you're creating, uh, you know, that you went set out to do on your own. Uh, became wildly successful with and now have this like massive uh, people who all like look at the content you create and they get to see like, hey, like there are people out there making things for me. And I I think that's very cool, especially when. Yeah, no, I mean, I love that. I mean, encouraging people to be creative. I wrote a book called Embrace Your Weird and it's like a workbook to open your creativity up. And I did that book not because I want to be a self-help guru, but I just honestly (laughs) going around the world Having people say, hey, I made a, a short film because of you, or I wrote a, a novel because of you, or I, I designed a board game because you inspired me, like, that's so much more important. There's no reality on the t- a screen that's attainable. And so when you can make something attainable for people, that's when you inspire somebody. And that's when it, I think it's really, really super important. And I think it's funny, making things attainable and realistic, like, that's slacker to a T, right? Like, that, that is, like attainable filmmaking, attainable characters. Like when I was watching that, I mean, everyone, you know, you know, kind of people, obviously there's sort of extremes of the characters within Slacker, but you know, people like who are like this guy, the you know, someone who just, uh, he's trying to impress these girls like, oh, I'm on a list uh, to play this band. And he gets there like he's not on a list, right? Like there's all these sorts of things that like you realize like it, all these stories don't have to be so grand, but even stories at the most like micro level where you only get to meet a character for five minutes is still very like, profound. Yeah. And also it's like character, you know, uh, dealing with character versus plot. I think we're in a plot different world right now. And so to me, like having those little characters and giving them their moment versus like, you know, brushing over them and making them only be a service to the lead guy character. Honestly, like, I think Mm -hmm. that's kind of beautiful. And if you watch those old thirties movies, like how many awesome character actors are there in those that you're just like, Oh, that guy's so So funny. It's that guy. He's in everything. So do you see like a sort of through line between bringing up baby and slacker? Like if you're talking about these two movies that shaped the way you look at movies or do you look at the way of uh, the way uh, women and females are portrayed on screen? Is there some sort of through line between the two slacker bring up baby or you think they're just I mean, two- yeah, I think independent uh, thinking, I think being yourself in a way that's not, uh, uh, Certainly nobody's apologizing for being themselves. I think there's sort of like a rebellious nature almost. Like uh, Catherine Hepburn is aggressively eccentric, right? And I think with slackers, yeah, it's, it's so, so people good. are aggressively <laughs> exact, uh, odd in a sense, right? There's nobody who's like, oh, that's kind of a boring character, right? They're all very yeah. standout. They're all very uh, defined. Even people with like just a look the way that they put their clothes on and wait, the, their glasses or whatever. It's very, very... Um, what I see in life, like the other day I saw a a woman who was probably 65 
dressed head to toe in pink. Like she had pink ruffles from, <laughs> she was wearing a pink cowboy hat. Like it wasn't Angelina. It was just another woman. And I'm like, how many times do you go to Walmart and like, there's just a dude in a weird outfit. Like that's real. Everybody's not wearing the same khakis. Everybody's not the same, you know, affluent sort of 28 year old at a party with a cocktail in their life. I just love representing life. You know, to me, I love non-actors, you know, uh, I love, I love uh, movies that star people who are not actually actors. Cause I love seeing the rough edges of their performances. It's so much more interesting to me. Um, that's why I love indie film. And I kind of sad that I don't get to go to festivals anymore. It's cause you'll see some of these unexpected, not so polished movies with people they made in Oklahoma. And I'm like, that's, that's way more interesting because at least they're saying something different. They're not just mm -hmm. like checking the boxes. So I guess that rebellious independent nature is in both these movies and the sort of like, you don't know what's going to happen next sort of feeling um, that I sadly get bored by a lot of TV because I kind of know the formula and that's why I watch British Baking Show instead. <laughs> <laughs> Who is your favorite British baker so far? Oh my God. It has to be Kim Joy. Kim Joy. Remember her? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kim Joy was great. She little chibi things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she was robbed, okay? She was Kim robbed. Kim Joy was great. Who did she go up against? Was she, she up against Raul? Yeah, Raul. Yeah, and he won, okay. which I loved him too, but he kind of choked yeah. toward the end, man. She really did, did deserve it. Yeah, Raul, uh, when he he was such a charming guy to watch because he was so not confident with himself. Yeah, and, like, I loved didn't him. didn't think I he did. should be there. I loved him, he but he great, choked but yeah. toward the end. He did not deserve The producers influenced that choice, okay? I'm so sorry. <laughs> They didn't want him to be like so upset with himself afterwards. Uh, and then who are your who are your favorite uh, commentators on that? I'm a I, I love Noel. I love the new set. They're so Noel and Sandy are so good. I mean, I am obsessed with Noel. Like, if we were gonna do a top TV shows, Mighty Boosh is number one. Mighty oh, Boosh and yes. Seinfeld are my two favorite comedies ever. You know, for TV. Uh, and mm -hmm. Benson, I love Benson as a child. Like, I don't even know why. Mm -hmm. That's, I don't even remember what it was about, but I just remember loving Benson. I guess I want a butler. But anyway, um, <laughs> no, Mighty Boosh is my literal favorite. Like, season two is the best TV, the best anybody. And I went, I even avoided going to a party one night because I knew that Noel was going to be there and I thought I would hyperventilate. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, it's funny you say that because. Um, so for those who don't know, the Mighty Boosh was an, uh, a, what, early 2000s, mid 2000s yes. British sketch comedy show. Channel that 4 Noel or Fielding, something, yeah. Yeah, Noel Fielding of the Great British Bake Off now, he was uh, one of the two main characters and writers on that show. Um, but to bring back YouTube again, Old Greg was maybe the first, like, weird thing I saw on YouTube. Wow. Um, it was like from the show, right? Old Greg. Yeah, from the show. Oh, yeah. So if, you, if you haven't heard of Old Greg, I recommend watching it. Yes. It's, it's a it's a weird five minutes, but crack it's the Fox, most like the crack fox is like the best thing. And and like if you get into Mighty Boosh, like Mighty Boosh and what is the other movie? Oh, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Garth Marenghi's Dark Place was the same year, I think, as the Mighty Boosh or whatever. And anyway, it's if you have not seen this show, you've got to watch it on YouTube. It is so funny. So it's a fake documentary about a Stephen King-like person who wrote a book that was adapted into a television show so that the documentary is interviewing the people who made the show and then you show you see parts of the show in the show. It is so surreal and weird and people in the show are deliberately acting badly. I can't even tell you how funny this show is. So anyway, yeah, if you haven't seen that or Mighty Boosh, Mighty Boosh is a little hard to get into. The first couple episodes are rough of the first yeah. season. It's set in a zoo and it's not quite as funny as it should be. But just stick with it because it gets crazy. And season two, they get out of the zoo and they go to like their own clothes shop. And it's incredible. Crack Fox is my favorite thing ever. And they do musical numbers and their outfits are crazy. It's just so good. Thank you so much. I'm glad we got to tap in that little bit of TV there at, at the end. Thank there. you. Yeah. Um, so where can people keep up with you? Uh, to find out all the other stuff you're doing, if they, they want to see your Twitch streaming or whatever yes. project you're coming out or um, things like that. The good thing, I do have a podcast called Felicitations. It's just me ranting into a mic and I'm a, a month behind on overdue, but that's quarantine for you. Um, okay. I do stream on Twitch. It's twitch.tv slash Felicia Day. I stream like three times an, uh, a week at night around 7 p.m. Pacific. So come see some of my D&D or just my silly gaming and um, I always have some kind of voiceover coming out. I'm on Maximum Venom right now. I'm working on a couple of writing projects that'll maybe be out next later this year. So just follow me on Twitter, twitter.com uh, Twitter slash Felicia Day, Instagram.com slash Felicia Day, and I will be posting all about the things I do, which are constantly always changing, never consistent in career or choice, and I will never change. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Felicia. Thanks uh, a lot, Hopefully, Ian. we get to see each other at some sort of con or event soon uh, when... In person, yes. This, I love yes, that. Your enthusiasm yes. and your knowledge is so fascinating. I'll have to listen <laughs> to all the other podcasts. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. Okay, bye. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to head over to imdb.com slash podcasts for more content on Felicia and to easily add the movies that changed her life to your IMDb watch list.